presence. This is the season of Lent, the season of penitence and confession. I have to confess that there's a mistake in the bulletin. I know that's shocking to you, right? I'm actually going to read a few less verses this day, which may be a joy for you. We might get out of here early, as someone said. I'm going to read chapter 10 of Mark's gospel, verses 13, but then I'm going to end at 22. These are two fairly familiar stories, stories that show up in other gospels as well. They're stories that Jesus engages with people, again, like I said to the kids, people that don't typically be, are not engaged with by rabbis, by healers, by adults. And then next week, we'll dive into how those that he typically does deal with, the disciples and others, how his words today affect them. Let us listen now for a word from our Lord through the writer of Mark's gospel, the 10th chapter, verses 13 to 22. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to those people. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and he said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Jesus continues, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, they will never enter it. And Jesus took up the little children in his arms. He laid his hands upon them and he blessed them. After this, Jesus was setting out on a journey and a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. The man responded to Jesus and said, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at this man, loved him. He loved him, and then he said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then you can come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This is the word of the Lord. We are in the middle, I should say, the beginning of the season of Lent. It began last week when Martha Morkesh was here preaching for us. We're beginning a season of Lent. We say it's 40 days, but we're not good mathematicians because we don't like Sundays, so we cut out some days. But nonetheless, we're in the season of Lent when we are called to look inward, to examine ourselves to examine our relationships with one another, and most importantly, to examine how God is a part of our entire lives or not. It is a time when we're trying to make some meaning of what's going on in our own lives. We're asking one of the most basic questions that God is actually asking us as well. Who are you? Who am I? we ask. The easiest and the best way, I think, to answer this question is to turn it around and say, I am. Begin with the basic answers. I am a man. I am a woman. We also define ourselves by the relationships that we hold in our lives. I'm a spouse. I'm a grandparent. I'm an uncle. Jobs are good ones too. I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a sock maker, I'm a farmer. Religion is another great way to define yourself. I am a Christian. I am a member of Howard Memorial. Those define us on a basic level. but They don't really tell us much about other people, right? You got to go a little bit deeper. You go beyond the descriptors, I am. This is challenging though. Last year, as a part of our Vital Worship Grant that brought us Martha Morkesh and as a part of our Lenten lectures over the next six weeks, 
The beginning of that grant meant that Katie Schultz and I, members of that committee, had to fly to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to Calvin Seminary, which is the seminary that gives out the grants. I was thrilled. Not only had we received this grant, but I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I only lived there for a year, so I don't really know much about the spot, but I was going where I was born. And I had the occasion one afternoon to go running, and I went out and I saw the Presbyterian church where I was baptized. I had one of those moments where it was beautiful, but it was also sad. I imagine that church was as big as St. Peter's, a little smaller than I remembered. My parents had put me in touch with some old friends who still lived in town. We were unable to make our schedules match, but I did get a chance to call them. I got a chance to say hi. Uh, we chatted on the phone. It was wonderful. I'm sorry we can't meet up, but, but I'm in town. You know, I'm a pastor now. I'm, I'm a pastor down in North Carolina. And at that moment, they both stopped the conversation. They sat silent on the phone. Oh, we think we'll always remember you as that little boy who loved to sit on the sidewalk outside your house, playing in the puddles. Oh, you were happiest when you were just in your diaper. That's the Ben Cain we know. I'm also a pastor, I kept telling them. We are defined by our actions, it turns out. I actually had my dad mail them a picture of me in my preaching robe to show them that I was not lying. I thought about that this week because that's the reality. If you want to get to know someone, you got to send pictures. You have to have follow-up conversations. You have to ask probing questions. You can't just stop with, I am. But here's where things get really tricky, right? Society, politics, culture, it's all changing. Gender identities are evolving in our society and the ways we used to understand ourselves and other people is changing and we have to be very attentive to that. But we're not really sure how to do that. What words do we use? We stumble over the questions that used to be so easy and the old traditional roles and categories that are not traditional anymore. Right? We're not trying to be rude, but we're not sure how to ask those questions anymore. Do you work outside the home is one of those questions that we stumble with. Not only that, right now in our political and cultural climate, we don't really want to share who we are. Because as soon as we say something, that term takes on a life of itself. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm pro this. I'm pro that. As soon as we utter those words, we have lost complete control of their meaning because we are immediately defined by them. Once we tell ourselves and other people our political persuasions, one of two things happens. There's that sweet but totally judgmental eye raise. Ah. Or there's the head nod and the appreciative pat on the back saying, you're on our team. And suddenly we're separated. I am. It's a question that we're called to, se- to answer. It's a statement we're called to finish, but it becomes an entrance in or a blocking from relationships with others. Suddenly, we're defined by one thing or another. Take today's stories, for example. Jesus welcomes the children, and he tells us that to those will be given the kingdom of God. And then he tells another man that he has to sell everything, give it away to the poor in order to follow him. Those are the things that Jesus defines his followers by, so that's a good way to define ourselves, is it not? Okay, we are called to become like children, and we are called to sell everything that we have. A friend of mine told me he tried this, sort of, at least the first part. He recently told me he was giving up being an adult for Lent. His 40 days of penitence would be filled with reassuming his childlike brain and heart that he would do whatever was on his mind. I'm hungry, so I'm going to eat. I've got energy, so I'm going to play. I'm bored, I'm going to go bug my parents. He woke up on the Thursday after Ash Wednesday, realized he wasn't interested in going to work, so he decided to go play all day. Jesus blesses those little children, tells them to come and to be blessed and to be held and that the kingdom of God is given to them. I am a child, he believed. 
Turns out the world didn't really care that he felt like a child. They kept calling, saying, where are you? What are you doing? We have work to be done. The other one is a little harder, isn't it? I haven't heard anybody come up to me and say, I sold everything. I gave it away to the poor, and and I'm now going to follow Jesus. Not that we haven't thought about this. I would imagine most of us have thought about it. Because what an amazing experience to be defined by that one thing, right? If you're going to be defined by one thing, then you want it to be great, right? You want to be on 60 Minutes, 2020. Jesus told the rich man that he needed to sell everything, so that's how I want to be defined, by Jesus. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to be the one who gives everything away. We start to think like this, I'm a follower of Jesus, we say to ourselves. And so as a follower of Jesus, we should realize that Jesus told this man to sell everything and to follow him. So we should do the same. We start to get a little bit excited, but then it gets complicated. Then we wonder, is money really bad? Is that what Jesus is saying? Should we give it all away? I mean, like, what's all, right? But then we think about how wonderful money is and how it's helped so many of us. And we think about all those around our community and our world and our heart rate increases and the pace of our word quickens as we look at this building and the ministries born here and spread to the world and we know money was a part of it. And we're so conflicted and our minds and our hearts begin to race and wonder how much is too much. And then we experience more questions like, how do we reconcile my wealth with other people's wealth with the needs of the world? And we wonder if we really could give everything away and follow Jesus. And then we think, I should call Ben and wonder, what does it mean to actually sell everything and follow Jesus? I mean, where is Jesus, right? Here's a handkerchief, because I just started sweating, right? It makes you nervous to think about you're supposed to be defined by Jesus. But that's hard. For better or for worse, the rich man is defined by this one experience. We don't know his name. We don't know his height, his weight. We don't know where he comes from. He's just a man who had many possessions. He is a man who engaged Jesus, a faithful man. And Jesus tells him, you have done everything that is expected of you except for one thing. Just sell everything you have. Give it away. The other thing that we actually do know about this man is that he grieves when he walks away from Jesus. The last thing we see is this man's back. And not exactly sure why he's grieving. Yeah, I mean, we can guess. He probably had a lot of money. Maybe his riches, though, were in those keepsake kind of things, right? The stuff that's not money, but it's old furniture, china, farmland that his family's owned for centuries. The really hard stuff to get rid of, to sell and to follow God. I don't know about you, but I, but I often think of this man as like a Scrooge-like individual that's literally just carrying big bags of money because it makes it easier for me. But maybe he was more than a rich man. Maybe he wasn't hoarding his money. He just happened to ask Jesus what he was called to do to follow him. What we find is it is incredibly difficult to define ourselves. It is almost impossible to finish the phrase, I am. And then to have a complete story told to the world. So what we find today is an invitation to take a deep breath. Because what we find in the story of Jesus' interaction with the man who was rich was the story of Jesus' interaction with that man. Despite our best intentions, we are really good about narrowing our focus and we begin to define ourselves by trying to squeeze ourselves into every story in Scripture. We say to ourselves, maybe by all standards of the world, we are rich, so we should give away everything. Jesus told that man, he's telling me, maybe. All we know is that Jesus was talking to that man on that day, and that was what kept him from defining himself. This is the challenge of defining ourselves. It can quickly become all we see. We want to be like children, right? In all aspects of life, that sounds amazing and fun, probably a little distracting, right, if we want to get much done. But the truth of the matter is, I do not want you all to be all children right now because I don't want you to turn into voraciously hangry children who are equal parts tired and hungry and completely irrational in your thinking, right? I want you to be who God called you to be. But who is that? 
In the opening chapter of a book I just finished, Malcolm Gladwell's latest, Talking with Strangers, he spends a whole chapter describing why he wanted to write this book. It is a phenomenal book, and I recommend it to any of you. It turns out that Gladwell is overwhelmed by one experience that happened in our country in 2015 in July. Sandra Bland committed suicide in a Texas jail. She was arrested during to what amounted to a routine traffic stop. She was pulled over for failing to signal while changing lanes. How many of us do that, right? The story unfolds as the tension between the officer and Sandra Bland escalates to the point that multiple police officers were called to the scene. She was arrested and kept overnight for three nights. On the surface, it's a routine stop. But for a variety of reasons, it turned terribly tragic. And her story stuck with Gladwell long after it left our news media cycle. He started asking what amounted to basic questions, because things don't make sense. She wasn't carrying a weapon. She did not have any drugs. She didn't have any illegal substances in her possession. So why was she arrested? Why was she kept so long? And why did that incident spark her to take her own life? Was the officer a bad person, right? It's easy to blame one person, but it turns out maybe he was caught in an unlucky situation. What he found as he investigated this bland arrest and subsequent death was that it had a whole lot to do with how we talk with strangers. His book is this fascinating journey throughout time, throughout history, as he travels to different regions of the world to look closely about how we and different cultures engage with strangers, what we find are some sobering realities. We are incredibly judgmental of strangers, and we are terrible at making accurate statements and judgments about them. Gladwell points out again and again how bad we are at understanding one another, even when we make snap judgments, and even when we look at each other face to face. Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of England, famously believed that he knew Hitler was going to promise him he would never invade Poland because, and I quote, he saw it in his eyes and the way that he conducted himself. Many people didn't trust Bernie Madoff, but he was always able to say the right thing at the right time, and their fears were sort of pushed to the side. Gladwell also talks about the CIA, the people who know everything about us, right? The stuff we don't even know about ourselves. And he says they're the best spies in the world and they have access to all the information and yet they fail to realize that their top Cuban analyst was a top Cuban spy who met regularly with Castro himself. Okay, Gladwell says, since we're so bad at judging others, the the implicit suggestion is that we need to get to know one another. That's easy, huh? Go get to know everyone, he seems to say. The challenge is as old as time. There is so much what we find that keeps us from knowing one another. Barriers are tall, they're formidable and wide. Race, class, socioeconomic status, age, and a whole host of other barriers keep us from walking up to other people and saying, Hi, I am Ben. Would you like to come to dinner? The truth is, most of the time, we don't want to invite them to dinner because we don't really want to get to know them, if we're being honest. That's what makes Jesus' blessing of these children and his invitation to the rich man so radical. It is unconditional love that he offers to them that we could never imagine. They show up as strangers, but he knows that there is more to them than children, right? There's more to them than saying, hey, come back when you're a little bit older. And he knows that that rich man is not just a rich man. There is so much more there. And so he builds relationships with them and with us. Unlike most adults, let alone rabbis or healers or prophets, he actually lets the children come and he lets them touch him because he loves them. And he knows that they're more than just kids. And it's because he loves the man who happens to have a lot of money and that he loves him and that's why he invites him to follow him. Because there's more than your money. It doesn't define you even though you think it does. It is a barrier, 
but it does not define you. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Stuck in Love. It's a story of a family of four. They experience the joys and the complications of love. The mom and the dad are divorced, but they're still collectively trying to raise their high school son and college-aged daughter. As the movie unfolds, it reveals the challenges each of the characters face with love on their own. The dad is still in love with the mom, even though they are divorced, even though he was unfaithful. The daughter is love adverse because she says, I've seen what it did to my parents and I'm not going to fall in love. The high school son is infatuated by one of his classmates, but he's not sure how to express it to her. What makes the movie fascinating is that they're all writers, and so they can write these beautiful descriptions of what love is and what love is not. They can use analogies and metaphors, but we know those are only words. The movie depicts their trials and tribulations over the course of one year that begins and ends on Thanksgiving Day. The opening scene is one of those beautiful choreographed scenes where the father and the son are enacting their tried and true Thanksgiving Day routine. The dad moves this way, the son moves around him. It's like this beautiful acting job. They're setting the table, they're making the turkey, putting the fixings together. And it's that setting the table that always strikes me so powerfully. The dad always sets an extra place for his ex-wife. It's hopeless. It is the source of many familial conversations. It drives the movie, to be honest with you, because the mom left the family. She's happy. She's remarried, on the outside at least. But what he proclaims is what we know. We're more than one decision. The dad knows this, and he cannot let go of the deeply held desire to at least invite someone because he still loves them. He knows that there is more to their love than what their kids know and what we know. And so it is with Christ. There is a spot for you. He knows the power of our definitions. He knows that we're really good at saying I am and stopping there and focusing heavily upon that. And so he begins at the most basic beginning level and he says I love you. He says, I love you, and there is a spot at this table. Have a seat. And when we utter things like we think we need to be old enough or mature enough or worthy enough or we have sold everything and followed Christ, Jesus smiles at us and says, I love you. He says, this spot has been saved for you since the beginning of time. I don't care about that stuff. If you care about that stuff, that's good, but I love you. It is so difficult to define ourselves on our own. The world is going to try to do it. We're going to try to do it ourselves. And that's why Christ says, come. Start with me. Don't do it alone. And start at this very space, at this very spot, the same one we start the time with children with. Jesus loves you. May we walk with that knowledge throughout this season of Lent. Thanks be to God. Amen.